Good morning. Hi. Okay, buenos dias. Buenos dias. Have you here? Thank you, everyone who's here today. Thank you for those that are joining us by live stream as well, and for anyone joining us from C-SPAN as well. Thank you for for being with us. Um, it's an immense honor to welcome you to the Migration Policy Institute. For those of you that haven't been to MPI before, um, we are an organization that studies the movement of people worldwide, which means that, among other things, we do research, extensive research, evidence-based research, authoritative research. Um, we uh, bring people together for dialogue, for training, for learning opportunities, and we do a lot of pragmatic problem solving around issues of immigration and immigrant integration policy around the world. And we work in the United States. We also have a, a, an office in Brussels, in Europe. And we work a lot in Europe. But we also have worked around the world. And we've particularly spent a lot of time working with colleagues in Mexico and Central America on regional migration issues as well. So today's discussion fits well in, in things that, that we do at MPI, um, but it also fits very well with the Woodrow Wilson Center. And thank you for the Woodrow Wilson Center, too, and its Mexico Institute for co-sponsoring and co-organizing today's event. Thank you for our colleagues who are here. Duncan, you'll hear from in a moment. Um, and uh, great pleasure to, to work with them again. I was at the Wilson Center for many years as well, so uh, a great partnership that, that carries on. Um, this is a book we're here to talk about, uh, Vanishing Frontiers, the Forces Driving Mexico and the United States Together, but we're really here to talk, which comes out today, literally came out this morning, um, but also to talk more broadly about the U.S.-Mexico relationship. And the idea today is really going beyond the book, talking about the relationship itself. Um, and, and you're going to hear from really distinguished panelists in a moment, um, both Mexicans and Americans, uh, even someone from the U.K., uh, talking about this relationship. Um, uh, and, and how deep it is. And, and when I started to write this book, and, and depending on whether you ask my family whether I started 10 years ago or two years ago on this, um, it started to be an idea 10 years ago where there were various drafts, maybe eight or 10 years ago, and there were various drafts floating around, most of which didn't survive. But, but it was intensely written in the past two, two and a half years. The, the idea was trying to tell the story about how two countries, Mexico and the United States, have become so deeply integrated and so deeply interrelated in ways that we often miss, that both Americans and Mexicans often don't see, and how this has become a truly intimate relationship. Um, the introductory chapter is called Intimate Strangers, and the notion that we are intimately engaged with each other in ways we often don't see, but we're strangers still and that we can't, don't yet have the tools to understand how deeply integrated we are. Um, and so I wanted to tell that story, and I wanted to tell it through stories as well, because you know a lot of us spent have spent a lot of time um, trying to to tell this story through data and analysis, but also telling it through the human stories. And so this really is a book of stories. This is actually kind of how I describe the book often: is it's, it's a book of stories backed up by analysis and data, but largely tried to to let the the human stories speak. Um, and you know, three things have gone on, at least in this relationship. One is obviously economics. We've become economically intertwined in ways we weren't 20 or 30 years ago. Um, and that's significant and, and phenomenal. And it, you know, as we'll talk about with Carla and Antonio and others, I mean, it, we don't just trade things together. We talk about NAFTA as a trade agreement, but it's not really a trade agreement. It's actually about manufacturing things together. It's about actually doing things, actually having a, a common, uh, becoming a common economic platform within the global economy. And that, that's a huge shift in the last 20 or 30 years. Um, also, clearly, migration has driven this relationship in innumerable ways. You know, one in 10 Americans, more than one in 10 Americans is of Mexican descent. Most fairly recent history, most, you know, one, two, three, four generations. So this is still recent migration. Um, one in 10 Mexicans, one in 10 people born in Mexico lives in the United States. Um, there are about 12 million Mexican-born people in the United States. Um, but there's also about a million Americans living in Mexico right now. You know, and this is something that's passed really under the radar, but there's almost a million Americans living in Mexico. If you believe the Mexican census, it's 740,000. Um, your Roberta may have fresher statistics on this, but it is a large number of people. Some of them are Mexican descent. Some of them have returned to Mexico with Mexican parents. Some of them had no connection with Mexico, no, certainly no heritage connection with Mexico before they moved there. So it's, it's a diverse group, and, and it's a group that's begun to reshape Mexican society in new ways, but also build links to the United States in new ways. And finally, of course, we're neighbors. Right? And, and that's something that's not going to change. And whether we, we love each other or we fight with each other in any given day, we're going to continue to be neighbors. And, and it's not even like when we talk about our neighbors in our neighborhood where you could actually get up and move. It might be very costly to do it, but you could get up and move. We actually can't get up and move. You know, barring a gigantic earthquake or an asteroid that you know, hits the Earth, um, we're going to be neighbors for a really long time. And, and that's made a huge difference. You know, one of the sub-themes in the book also is that border communities 
deal with each other in a much different way than, than people further out. And so a lot of the cooperation, a lot of the changes happened in the region where people actually have to deal with each other. And Alan, I know we'll talk about this some as well. You know, where, where it all comes together at the border, people actually have to deal with each other in different ways, in very pragmatic ways that aren't driven by ideology. Um, but the border has also moved out, right? And so the border was once San Diego and Tijuana, two cities I talk about here a lot, but, but also increasingly Los Angeles and Phoenix and Dallas are border cities, right? I mean, these are, and the border is moving, and in some ways Chicago's a border city, right? In some ways Detroit's a border city, right? These are things that actually have moved out, you know, because it's not just the physical border, but, but the linkages that go on. And, and those linkages are sometimes cultural, sometimes family, and sometimes deeply economic. Um, the stories in this book run the gamut, and they go from, you know, dry topics like manufacturing, although I actually hope to make that a little bit interesting, but, you know, there's some trade and, and manufacturing and all that sort of stuff. Mexican investment in the United States, actually Mexican investment turning around small towns in the United States. Sorry, to things like film and sports and food. Um, food is probably the place where we have the closest interaction with each other, but film, right? I mean, four of the last five Oscar-winning directors are, are Mexican. Something happened between the Mexican and American film industries that's unique, right? And, and it's a bit of story about three people who are, you know, friends and incredible filmmakers. But but it turns out when you dig beneath that, there is a huge connection going on between the Mexican film industry and the U.S. film industry. It's about co border cooperation. It's about security cooperation. There are a couple of chapters looking at public security, something Alan knows very well. How deep, the, you know, regardless of what happens at a political level between the two countries, and lots of mistakes have been made at a political level, the degree of trust that's grown up between people on the front line of the security relationship, and that's police officers, intelligence officers, and non-governmental advocates who are dealing with each other across the border in new ways, trying to deal with a problem that's shared between the two countries. Um, we're at a moment where there's lots of negative rhetoric about the U.S.-Mexico relationship. You know, it, it's easy. A few of us were talking before we came, you know, is, is, is this relationship coming apart or is it coming together? You know, it's hard to tell in the moment. Those of us that live in the moment of politics and those of us that are watching this in Washington, we tend to live in the moment of politics. I, I suspect that some of you who are outside Washington watching this conversation have a, the benefit of a longer view on these things. We tend to get drawn into whatever the latest tweet or the latest statement from a political candidate or a government leader is. Um, in the short term, things are going to be pretty rocky. We know that. Um, there's lots of, of things on the table. And this is a complicated relationship. I mean, I, and let me go back and say, you know, the integration that's been going on, I, I, I will argue, and I do argue in this book, is overall very beneficial for the United States. It's in our self-interest to engage Mexico in new ways. But it's not always easy, and it's not always uncomplicated, and it's not always without problems. I mean, there are actual real problems that happen along the way as the two countries engage with each other. And so right now we're at a moment of reevaluating some of these things. People in both countries are questioning some of the assumptions we've had in the past, sometimes rightly, sometimes wrongly, but it's going to be a bumpy road for a while. But if you look at the long term, I'm very convinced, and I think a lot of the other people here on, the, on our panel today are as well, then in the long term, you're going to, to find that this is a relationship that will grow closer with or without the politicians. And the politicians will eventually come along because in the end, the, the, the larger forces in society, the social forces, the economic forces, the cultural forces um, are, are going to be much stronger than the political wins that we're seeing right now. So thank you to everyone for being here. Let me uh, introduce Duncan Wood, the director of the, the Mexico Institute. Actually, before I do, let me thank Michelle and Lisa, by the way, from MPI for all their work putting this together. And let me thank the Wilson Center, both the Mexico Institute and the communications team at the Wilson Center for all their, wake, all their work in making today's event a success. And here's Duncan Wood, the director of the Mexico Institute at the Woodrow Wilson Center and a good friend. Thank you. So Duncan, thanks for doing this. Morning, everybody. It's great to be here. Um, one of the invitations uh, to participate that you could not refuse. Um, and I have to say, first of all, obviously, thanks to MPI, to the Wilson Center, to everybody who's put this together. Um, but most of all, a, a quick uh, uh, recognition of Andrew. Um, I like to call him the godfather of Mexican studies in Washington. Um, I have to use that term because he hired me. Um, he also hired my colleague, Chris Wilson, um, he even hired my wife at one point, which is uh, a strange kind of family connection, which means that, yes, I really am indebted to you for two incomes. So I would never get away from that. Um, in the spirit of being the godfather of something, Andrew is also, I would say, the hardest working man in Mexican studies. Um, he not only writes books, uh, he works incredibly hard at multiple things. He travels. He has babies. Um, whilst doing all of this. It's kind of an amazing thing that one could reproduce at the same time as you're being so productive in so many other areas. 
I remember talking to him one day at the Wilson Center, and I said, so when do you find the time to write books? And he said, well, I get up at four o'clock, I uh, sort of, you know, uh, get ready, and then I start writing at five, and then uh, come into the office. I'm like, wow, that's dedicated. At five o'clock, I am still firmly in the, uh, in the arms of, uh, of Morpheus, and, uh, you know, I don't begin even thinking about writing until about, uh, about nine o'clock when I get to the office. But Andrew's life and, and his career is something that is not just to be admired, but it's something that many of us share, I think, and that's his passion. Many of us share the fact that he has blended his life with his career. His dedication to Mexican studies matches his dedication to Mexico and his life that he has lived on both sides of the border. And many of us in this room share that, I would say. We feel the successes and failures of the bilateral relationship. It's not just that we analyze them, it's not just that we write about them, we opine about them, but we feel them. We feel the ups and downs, and of course, especially the current crisis that we're going through. And I, I, I don't use the term crisis lightly. I, I do firmly believe that. Um, the book itself. Um, sometimes a colleague sends you a book and it's an obligation. You say, okay, yeah, I'll read this because it's a colleague and I should be informed about this. Not the case here. The book is terrific, as I, as I did in my Facebook review the other day, a cracking good read. It really is. It's one of those books that you pick up and you want to keep reading. And that's not always the case um, with books that come out of think tankers, as all of us are painfully aware in this room. It's about the human aspect of policy. Um, what Andrew has managed to do is to highlight how all of this highfalutin stuff that we talk about in the think tank community here in Washington and in Mexico City and other parts of the, uh, of the continent, how that actually plays down to the human level. Um, it's about, as Andrew has said, living the, the relationship intimately because we are intimately involved in that. And what Andrew recognized was that despite all of the excellent work done by many of the people in this room on analyzing the bilateral relationship, there was a need for narrative. And we've said this many, many times over the years. Who's going to write the stories? Who's going to tell the stories that will actually get through to human beings so they begin to understand? And therefore, there was a need for this book. This is not just a nice book that we all enjoy reading. There was a need for this book, I would argue. And although it's probably not going to have a, an immediate impact on policy right now, the long game is what we're playing. And the long game means that we've got to change hearts and minds. And I think that uh, Andrew's reference, obviously, to the stories involving film and sports and food are, are critical. Um, I'd love to see the, uh, the movie deal, Andrew, at some point. I mean, wouldn't that be great if we could tell the stories of the bilateral relationship in that sense? Analysis is, of course, vital uh, when we come to, uh, to study the bilateral relationship. But Andrew has managed to translate that analysis and put it into a form which is much more accessible for a lay public. So two things before I, I close. First of all, read it. It's not just something that you buy and you put on yourself. I know that a lot of books that we do are like that. They look very nice on bookshelves. Actually, read this one. And it's not a burden. It's not, a, it's not an obligation. Get through it. It's a terrific read. And the second one is that what Andrew's managed to do is he's managed to really scratch the surface, haven't you, of the stories that Mexico and the United States and Mexicans and Americans and all of us other crazy people Europeans, Brits, whatever we are, not quite sure anymore, um, that, that live in this space. There are so many other stories that are out there, and the stories will continue to come in the future. So in many ways, I would say the book stands as a, an opportunity and a, a, a really a motivation for the rest of us to tell more stories. Um, those stories are going to be a different kind of story, I think, for uh, the next couple of years. We're going to see stories which are less positive, but we have to remember the stories in this book and keep looking for those positive stories. So thank you very much for having me here, Andrew. Congratulations um, you know, uh, uh, to somebody that I do consider to be my brother. Um, thank you very much for, for including us in this project. Um, let me now uh, introduce Ambassador Jose Antonio Zabel Goitia who uh, is a very, very distinguished Mexican diplomat. We're grateful that you've come here today. Um, I know it's an incredibly busy time for everybody at the Mexican Embassy. Um, uh, the ambassador has been ambassador in Bolivia. Um, he is, has extensive experience in, the, uh, in, in U.S. consulates across the country. He was director general at SRE for Latin America and the Caribbean, director of relations between, the United, between Mexico, the United States, and Canada, 
Um, and of course, right now he is DCM at the Mexican Embassy here in Washington. Grateful for your presence here, and please, the microphone is yours. This is magnetic. <laughs> well, good morning to everybody. It's really a privilege to speak before so many young people, and also before uh, such, a, such a distinguished audience, and um, speaking before uh, really people that uh, have engaged in the US-Mexico relationship, like uh, Ambassador Scarla Hills and uh, Roberta Jacobson, Commission, Commissioner Alan Bersin, uh, my colleague uh, Antonio Ortiz Mena, Duncan Wood, and uh, of course, Andrew Seeley, who, Andrew, uh, Ambassador Gutierrez has asked me to convey his uh, congratulations for this magnificent uh, book. Um, Andrew, your book is, as always, a thoroughly well-documented and, and well-argued material. It enriches the knowledge and understanding of the complex and often misunderstood re bilateral relations between Mexico and the United States. Your book is a timely reminder that further than geographical vicinity, our countries are bound by their peoples and their daily interactions and exchanges. It is also an invitation to recognize that as the ties between Mexicans and Americans grow stronger by these daily interactions, both countries grow stronger and closer together and more interdependent. Mexico and the United States share a very long land border but also a very deep border region where academic, commercial, social, cultural, gastronomic, religious, linguistic, and family ties have been established for more than 150 years. Two characteristics have defined these exchanges. First, their strength and intensity reach their highest magnitude at the border and at the local level and gradually decrease without disappearing as we move away from the border. But also we can perhaps agree with Andrew that this is changing. The integration of our societies is not exclusive of communities in our border region. As he rightly describes in the book, there are also intense interactions of Mexicans and the US and Americans in Mexico all the time and in all kinds of, acti and in all kinds of activities. And second, as our true bilateral relation consists of these millions of daily individual exchanges, the most influential actors are our peoples and our societies. In this sense, governments are not the main drivers of our integration phenomenon. Sad as it may sound, our capital's involvement is marginal. Governments and us diplomats like to think that we develop the bilateral relation and when in reality, is the people that create it. We in government are always delayed in developing integration policies. The thing we do best is adjusting our rules and regulations to respond to the integration trends that are already occurring. What both governments have done mostly is develop the framework to organize these powerful and permanent integration forces. We must understand that no country can isolate from others, and much less so if isolationism tries to contain forces pulling it towards its neighbors. The strongest integration forces are social and economic, not political. Forces like mixed families, production and value chains, joint ventures, academic exchanges, tourism, cultural crossovers, and bi-directional migration flows, to mention just some of them. However, we do governments try to help. A good example of how our governments are facilitating the integration of our countries is cooperation in our shared border. It had been enhanced to make it more secure for both our nations, to facilitate the lawful movement of people and goods, and to join efforts in confronting the unlawful ones. Our governments do not create the flows of people and goods. We make them easier to happen in a secure and efficient manner. Through regulation adjustments, the governments of the US and Mexico have facilitated the integration of our societies by building a tighter interconnection of our financial systems or by easing the development of better telecommunications 
to the extent that nowadays a phone call to the US and Mexico is considered a local call. A true North American energy market has been created, allowing both countries to benefit from our respective energy and oil resources. On the movement of people, it is important to mention that there has been a substantive change in migratory flows. First, Mexican migration transitioned from a seasonal flow to, cur to currently a reverse flow by which Mexicans are returning to Mexico while Americans are migrating to Mexico. Second, the flow of migrants arriving in the United States is comprised less by Mexican nationals and more by Central Americans. As we think of vanishing frontiers, we must acknowledge the complexity of sharing such a vast land border. And also, we must remember that through joint efforts and a high level of cooperation, we have been able to avoid terrorists crossing our border. I am certain that another element of our countries coming closer together is a deeper understanding of our shared interests and the new threats that we face together. In terms of security, we will continue moving away from finger pointing at each other and developing more collaborative common strategies. Mexico and the United States are bound to remain together. Our ties will continue growing because as Ambassador Gutierrez frequently says, a strong and successful Mexico is in the best interest of the United States, just as much as a strong and successful United States is in the best interest of Mexico. Congratulations, Andrew, once more for your contribution on putting this in, in, uh, those, these issues on top of the agenda. Thank you, Ambassador. That was very compelling, and we appreciate that. And, and please convey our greetings to everyone at the embassy, including Ambassador Gutierrez, and really honored that you could join us today. Um, we'll turn to our panel now. We really have three very distinguished panelists here. Um, before I introduce them, let me say that uh, uh, we will have questions and answers in a bit for the panel. And so you can tweet questions at us at Migration Policy. You can also use the hashtag MPI Discuss if you want to tweet out about this event. Um, and you can also email questions to us at events at migrationpolicy.org. And if you're in the room, you can go analog and just raise your hand, by the way, when we get to <laughs> questions and answers. Um, no need for the technology. But you are welcome to tweet from the audience as well, of course. Um, we really have a, a uh, phenomenal panel. And, and let me start. I'll introduce all three, and then we'll, we're going to do this as sort of a question roundtable, more DeVos style than, than, than presentations. Um, the Honorable Carla Hills. Carla is, I think, known to everyone in this room. Um, she is president of Hills and Company, um, but she's also the former U.S. Trade Representative. She is the one who negotiated the original NAFTA agreement. Um, so the she was there at the worst agreement that you've ever seen. <laughs> 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 yes, you want to know who, who negotiated the worst agreement ever? This? <laughs> no, Carla really is. I mean, she she led our trade relations at, at probably the time where we had the greatest. I mean, NAFTA is is obviously the signature agreement, but there was just an enormous um, effervescence of commercial relationships at the end of the Cold War, and so a really signature moment of change in, in U.S. trade policy. She also served as, as Secretary of um, Housing and Urban Development and has uh, chairs the, the American Dialogue. I believe you chaired the Council on Foreign Relations as well. I mean, has innumerable uh, titles that we could add here. And, and thank you for making time to be here with us today. Um, the Honorable Alan Burson. Alan is, is the former Assistant Secretary for Policy in the Department of Homeland Security and the former Commissioner of Customs and Border Protection. I met him actually when I was a grad student. He won't remember this, but I do. Um, when I was a, a grad student, and he was the U.S. Attorney for the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of California, um, and uh, he has done did quite a few things in between that and Homeland Security, including being the head of of, uh, of the public schools in San Diego, San Diego Unified District, right. I believe it's called, and the Secretary of Education of the State of California, which is an enormous position as well. Um, but he has always had a, a special commitment to, though he has worked globally and he has worked statewide and locally, I mean, you really span from local government up to global concerns, has always had a particular um, interest in how the U.S. and Mexico can work together and how this comes together at the border. Um, and Antonio Ortiz Mena joins us from uh, the Senior Vice President of Albright Stonebridge Group, adjunct professor at uh, CIDE University in Mexico, and also a visiting professor at the Edmund Walsh School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. Many of you know him because for many years he was the, the minister counselor at the Mexican Embassy for Economic Affairs. Um, but before that, and some of you will remember his academic life, 
We, we also met as grad students, actually. Right. And you do remember that, because we were both grad students together. That. So um, we, we actually taught together at the same time for Peter Smith, uh, many years ago, a distinguished professor of Latin American studies, where he was teaching assistants back in the day. But Antonio um, also had a very, before he got into government and before he got into his current career, was really one of Mexico's most published and best respected scholars of trade. Um, and, and not only trade with the US, actually, but trade with Brazil, trade with Europe, trade with Asia, and published extensively. Then he had actually been earlier in the NAFTA negotiations. You've been right. in government. You went that into was academia. On the side that, that the great agreed. That's right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> he, he was on that side, yes. got into academia, published extensively about this, became, you know, really did a lot of the canon, actually, of Mexican scholarship on and international scholarship on Mexico's trade policy, and then moved into working in, in government and now into the private sector. So great to have all three of you here. And, and let me open up by, you know, asking Carl about, I mean, you, you know, back in, in the early 1990s, it would have been probably hard to imagine where we are today. And, and forget the, the, the political moment itself, but just how much trade there is going on between Mexico and the United States and Canada. What, what difference did NAFTA make for our economy? Because ultimately, you know, as you sat down and negotiated, this was about our competitiveness and the future of the American economy. What difference did NAFTA make? The NAFTA made an enormous difference. But let me start by saying that uh, I think your book will also. Thank you. For there is um, so much misinformation floating about <coughs> between <coughs> our governments, our people. If you walk outside the doors of... Uh, this institute and ask the first 10 people you meet, what do you think about the North American Free Trade Agreement? Or what do you think about the bilateral relationship with Mexico? Or how do you think that the trio, Canada, Mexico, and the United States, how do they work together? Mm. Probably you get, well, it doesn't matter. Well, it does matter, and it matters hugely. And Andrew Seeley has written a book that I swear to you, I have read, and you cannot put it down. Because he takes the facts that we're all going to talk about, and he translates them into a story, a human story. Something that you just, you want to read that chapter to see what happened to that family that was in this place that was having these problems. But change did occur in the early 1990s. In Mexico, President Salinas very much wanted to open the market. Mm -hmm. It was highly restricted. Mm -hmm. And uh, they'd gone through a very difficult decade of the 80s. President Bush Sr. very much wanted to open the markets. We in the United States have 5% of the world's population, mm -hmm. producing roughly 20% of the output hey, you can't eat it all. And uh, he believed firmly that if we could get North America marshaled together with less complex rules, it would make a difference. And it truly has. Mm -hmm. When you think of the differences mm -hmm. that the NAFTA made, we now have a market of $19 billion 490 million consumers, and it didn't occur before. We eliminated all the restrictions on industrial goods, most of the agricultural goods, and we created rules to protect intellectual property, rules to protect investment, mm -hmm. and rules that if we had a dispute, as even you do in families, <laughs> that we had a mechanism for resolving those disputes. And uh, our interregional trade exploded. It's now six times what it was then. We have 14 million jobs that are connected to our trade. Our largest export destinations, number one, Canada, global export destination. Number two, Mexico. We sell more to Mexico than we sell to all the rest of Latin America. Indeed, we sell more to Mexico than we sell to France, Britain, Germany, and the Netherlands. This is a bad agreement. This is an incredibly good agreement that has smoothed out the rules because 90% 
of our exporters mm -hmm. are small and medium sized businesses. Mm -hmm. And for them to be able to ship across borders as they do today, it makes a difference. One out of nine of our, uh, uh, one of, of, out of nine jobs is connected to tourism. Mm. Tourism has blossomed with Mexico and with Canada too. And so we wanna hold on to these issues. These are just the economics but I think in terms of political and working in the global arena, having two neighbors, friendly, <coughs> north and south, two oceans, east and west, we are so blessed. You look around the world and there's friction between the next door neighbor and the nation you're speaking of here we have a family and we're working together. We share investments, tourism, trade, and it's something we need to hold on to. But if we're to hold on to it, we need to educate the American people about exactly what is at stake. And we have built supply lines that are so well connected that it has made North America and the United States has gotten the dividend of it, uh, the most competitive region in the world. You wanna cut off those pipelines, you wanna cut off the imports from Mexico mm -hmm. when 60% are intermediate products that make your product globally competitive, hey, you're making a big mistake. And when 40% of everything that we import from Mexico is U.S. content, it tells you how interconnected we are. So I would say to everyone who's listening to this program and is reading this book, get out and march to keep our partnership with our southern and our northern neighbors strong, vibrant, and lifelong. So. Wow. Okay. Thank you, Carla. We will come back to you in a moment on this because that was an immensely compelling way to open up. But let me turn to Alan Burson for a minute. And I'm going to ask you, not now, but I will come back a little bit later and talk about an article you wrote in the Washington Post a few days ago about how to handle migration at the border. So we'll come back to migration in a minute. But before we do that, taking advantage of what Carl was talking about, about how we have these extensive flows happening across the border, one of the things that you were deeply involved in through the years, and this started in the 1990s. I actually remember reading an article you wrote it must be 2000, 2001, maybe it's even 1999, where you had just left being U.S. attorney and you wrote, so it was probably early 2000s, and, and you wrote about this actually before it even happened. But in, in the last 15 or 20 years, we've moved towards managing the border in a different way, not thinking of it just as a line, but thinking in terms of secure flows. How did that change? And, and we've gone from managing it as, as just one country to thinking about more shared forms of management. Tell us what changed here. So, uh, Andrew, first let me, uh, building on, on the uh, Carla's uh, calling this a family, to thank you, as Duncan and the ambassador did, for writing the family history. And I think what's remarkable about this book is that uh, it's always good to be at a place where you're supposed to teach when you end up learning. And listening to the ambassador and to Duncan and Carla, it reminds me, uh, and it, it's taught me why this book is so uh, extraordinary and so important for everyone to read. I always look at the data and then I listen to the rhetoric. And I have for many, many, many years not been able to figure out how the facts on the ground are so different from the perceptions and from the political rhetoric. But it is because in fact, we don't know the stories. <laughs> we don't know the human dimensions of this. In fact, we get data and the only anecdotes that we get, and this is not a criticism of journalism, journalism is always going to turn to the dangerous and the crisis. So the only anecdotes we get are bad stories. And we've never actually, till my friend uh, Andrew has taken on the task, and the analogy and the comparison to de Tocqueville is actually not uh, off at all, we start to see the positive stories. What makes the border, what makes the family? And in fact, uh, for most of uh, US-Mexico history, because of the uh, 
19th century war, La Linea, the line, east to west that separated the two countries was the key to the relationship. Uh, to add uh, insult to injury, uh, most Mexicans never forgot that uh, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo had resulted in the loss of half of Mexico's territory. And uh, the insult was that most Americans never knew it. So that we had a line in which sovereignty was asserted very vigorously and aggressively by the Mexican government, because in fact, in an asymmetrical relationship, it was only at the line that the countries were genuinely equal, because you could not cross that line. And that's what Andrew first saw and I saw when we both arrived about the same time at the US-Mexican border in the 1990s. And again, what's so remarkable is that this is not a history that Andrew's written. Uh, he was actually present at the creation. <laughs> and he's watched this uh, evolve. But it was about uh, the line. And it was finger pointing, as the ambassador indicated. Uh, we were not cooperative. We were friendly. After all, after the war, there were, we were technically demilitarized. But there was actually not a lot of trust there was not a lot of confidence. And the result was that everything was at arm's length. Uh, Mexican uh, uh, commentators would point to uh, immigration and say, uh, every Mexican has the right to leave Mexico. And every uh, US official would say, but it's illegal to cross the line uh, when you don't have a visa to do so. Narcotics. Uh, why can't you Mexicans uh, control the uh, narcotics uh, in your country with the Guadalajara cartel and the Ariano Felix uh, uh, gang? Uh, Mexicans would say, if you Americans didn't consume drugs at the rate that you do, we wouldn't have the problem we have. And by the way, the guns coming south are doing enormous damage to our people. Uh, and so on, it's all the way down the line. Every issue, particularly security issues, were the occasion for finger pointing. What happened as a result of NAFTA was that uh, Los Flujos went and masque la linea. For the first time, the flows north and south of people, goods, ideas, counted more than the line east-west. We respected sovereignty, but in fact, it was the flows and the interactions that are so well chronicled in vanishing frontiers that took precedence over la linea so that we were no longer totally tied to what happened at the line, and we could start to explore uh, the relationships. And that happened in security, and we can look at that later in the context of, of particular migration. Great. Tell, tell us briefly, before I go on to Antonio, tell us about the border bridge, because that's actually the subject of, of chapter one. It occurs to me I should ask you about that. You were so deeply engaged in this. And it, it's such a, though it's only one of many things yes. that happens at the border, it's such a fascinating visual symbol, and visuals matter. So, what uh, is this border, what yeah. is this bridge to the Tijuana airport? So, uh, I, as my wife says, I've had trouble holding on to jobs. Uh, my last job before coming back into the federal government right. was this was the chairman of the San Diego airport. That's right, right. yes. And those of you who have flown into San Diego know that it is a single runway, and it's bounded by the harbor, and it's bounded by the Marine Corps training base, neither of which are going to move. <laughs> so that you have the busiest single runway uh, airport uh, in, the, uh, in the world. The issue was, where do you, where do you uh, move it? And for many years, for 50 years, San Diego debated where the airport should be. Should it stay downtown, or should we move it out to Miramar Air Force Base? And finally, in 2006, during the Iraq war, there was a vote taken. And during the war, the Marines made it very clear they did not want to give up Miramar, so that, in fact, uh, the, uh, the decision was taken. And I was uh, fortunate enough to get involved uh, with 46 jurisdictions that were required to make a change to this little San Diego airport, the Lindbergh Field. And we're sitting uh, there, and uh, air, the airport authority came up with a $2 billion plan to build out the run, build out not the runways, which you couldn't change, but the gates and so on. And someone asked and said, well, what are you going to do when you run out of capacity at this air, airfield with 
a single uh, a single uh, uh, runway. And uh, Dwight Eisenhower, President Eisenhower had a great line. He said, when you can't solve a problem, make it bigger. <laughs> <laughs> so we made the problem bigger because in fact, 15 or 16 miles from San Diego airport is Rodriguez Field in Tijuana, which has a runway and the capacity for several runways parallel to the border. And that's what started the process toward building the uh, what Denise Duchaney calls and Andrew Chronicles is the bridge across the fence. And now uh, it took seven years. And I, I, uh, I think there are a lot of uh, fathers and mothers of this uh, idea. The only, the only credit I give to myself was that I was the Forrest Gump who managed to be at the airport authority and then became the commissioner of customs and border protection so that everyone who tried to kill it <laughs> Had to go through Alan Burson. <laughs> Kept meeting me uh, to say, no, this is something we need to do. And in fact, uh, it, uh, for those of you who haven't uh, experienced it, uh, I urge you to do that. Uh, it's completely changed air traffic patterns in, in ways that were uh, unanticipated. It's created possibilities of movement for people from California, people from Mexico City who don't want to fly through Dallas and Houston to then fly to the west coast to San Francisco, can now fly into San Diego and fly up the coast. And we've just begun exploring the implications of this uh, remarkable uh, bridge across the wall. And the bridge across the wall allows people in San Diego to use the Tijuana airport almost as though it's a San Diego yeah. airport. I mean, yeah. essentially, the Tijuana airport became San Diego's international airport. This which custom is just clearance. a creative way, the custom, right. yes by using really creative a public private venture and a lot of things that Alan was able to, with his colleagues to get through when he was at Homeland Security, something that didn't cost taxpayers, but at the same time solved an incredibly needed problem and brought San Diego and Tijuana together in very unique ways. And if you want a symbol of where the relationship is really going, not because it's the most important thing that's ever happened in the relationship, I put it up in the top 10 or 15, it's certainly one of the most important, but, but it is the most visual, is, is seeing that bridge across the border fence and realizing it wasn't driven by ideology. It was driven by two countries and two, two metro regions solving a problem together. And, and they now talk about themselves increasingly as a single metro region. I actually have a quote from the, the mayor of San Diego, who's a Republican, um, in, in the book where he says, you know, we don't talk about two cities, we talk about a single metro region. And increasingly you have you know, two parts, and it's not just San Diego City, it's San Diego County as well, and Tijuana and the surrounding areas, thinking of each other as a metro region that's stronger together and hey, if they have to, they can compete with LA and San Francisco, right? I mean, there's a little bit of that in there as well. When you begin <laughs> to think of them as a metro region, San Diego is not the third city of California. It's it's up there as one of the top. It's a top one, top A, you know, tier A city. So, Antonio, let me tell us a little bit about one of these other. We'll come back to talk immigration in a moment, but tell us a little bit about um, Mexican investment in the U.S. I, mean, I think one of the more unusual stories that we've seen, and one that we all knew that NAFTA was going to unleash investment in Mexico, and, and it was a piece yeah. of what. The Mexican government wanted at the time, right? In the middle of a stagnant economy in the 1980s, early 90s, wanted really to generate investment in Mexico. And that worked, right? The first yeah. 10 years of NAFTA, there's a lot of American investment in Mexico, GE and now Walmart, and you know, you see American companies everywhere. But one of the untold stories is the last 10 to 12 years, we've seen an enormous amount of Mexican investment in the United States. And one of the stories, the, the book starts with the story of Hazleton, Pennsylvania, where, um, which was the epicenter of the, the anti-immigration debate at one point, a fascinating city, a city I really mm -hmm. enjoy, actually, and I think has a great future. But it's also a city that, interestingly enough, has now four Mexican-owned factories in and around the city. And you see a transformation where Mexicans went from being the debate around immigration to being actually the providers of jobs for people in the city, and how much this has happened in a lot of small towns. So tell us about Mexican investment in the US. That is something none of us really predicted. Yes, that, uh, that's right. In fact, uh, NAFTA uh, Chapter 11 was negotiated to allegedly protect Canadian and U.S. investment in Mexico. There was no such uh, a provision in the Canada-U.S. agreement, but it turns out that there's a whole lot of Mexican investment in Canada and also uh, in the U.S. In, in this book, you give a lot of great examples from, I just noted down a couple of names, Bimbo, Racini, Nemac, Vitro, Lala, Mexiquem, Alpec, Sigma, Gruma. I'm sure a lot of you don't know what these companies do. You will actually have to read the book to know, <laughs> to know, what, to know what, what they do. You know the American brand names. Yeah, but, yes. but you do know, you know Thomas English Muffins or Sarah Lee or 
or Antimans or Borden, you know, those are all now owned by uh, uh, Mexican companies, right? And they're creating jobs in the U.S. But let me highlight one investment that I think uh, really shows the potential of NAFTA and the pitfalls of the measures that are being taken as we speak. So uh, there is a company called Midcontinent Nail in Poplar Bluff, uh, Missouri, that's close to Arkansas. And in 2013, it was bought by a Mexican steel company, uh, De Acero. By 2013, about 80 to 85% of the nail market in the US was comprised of imports, mostly from, from China. And uh, Midcontinent Nail was the largest remaining US uh, producer. And thanks to the purchase of Midcontinent by the Acero, not only did the company survive, but it thrived. It doubled the amount of workers. It's still one of the major nail producers in the US. And how did they do that? Yes, it is, it's Mexican investment in the US, but also it's the cross-border supply chain. You need steel inputs from Mexico being sent to Poplar Bluff, Missouri to transform them to nails and keep manufacturing alive in the US. So this is an instant when this is not a zero sum game. Without Mexico, it would be a zero, okay? Without the international connection, this would be a zero. And uh, with this new tariffs imposed on aluminum and steel, who knows what the future of mid-continent nail or many companies like that that survive because of the trade and investment links with Mexico, and it's important to see this, it's investment and trade, uh, if, if those supply chains are, uh, are disrupted. And, and I think this brings home why trade and investment between Mexico and the US are good. I wanted to you know, congratulate Andrew on doing this because this is something I was never able to do at the Mexican embassy. I used to ask, and I'll be very frank, a number of US companies, Help me tell a story about why your investment in Mexico, I'm not talking about a Mexican investment in the US, is positive for your bottom line, for employment in the US, et cetera. And I feel that we still have a ways to go. A lot of the examples here are about Mexican investments in the US and how that is positive for the US. But we need more US companies speaking out and speaking frankly and sharing uh, stories. So I, I needed to... Uh, needed to uh, say that. And I'll briefly mention two other examples that caught my uh, attention. One of them has to do with North Dakota, and I think it's important because this is not a border story. At least it's more along the northern border than the southern <laughs> border. And you have a Republican state senator, Terry Wozniak, uh, from North Dakota, and it turns out that 30% of edible beans from North Dakota are bought by Mexico. Now, what will happen? Uh, if uh, if there's a tit for tat that affects agricultural trade, I would say that gracias NAFTA, it is thanks to NAFTA that the U.S. can export agricultural products to Mexico, including from North Dakota. Again, this is not a border issue. With this tit for tat tariffs, again, this whole thing can go away, and WTO tariffs are pretty high. So gracias NAFTA, this is why they're able to do that. Now, I did have a question because you said they export edible beans. I don't know who's buying the inedible. This is just, this is just an aside. Twerk. I don't know about the inedible beans, OK? Uh, and, and then you also have another story about energy interdependence, OK? Now, Mexico, the US, and Canada did nothing to have the resource endowments that they have in hydrocarbons, in wind, and solar. But we do have to work together to take advantage of that. And Andrew provides a great example in La Rumorosa to go back to the region. You also studied at uh, San Diego. So La Rumorosa is a mountainous region between uh, Tijuana and Mexicali along the, the you know, Baja California, California border. And it's a great way, a great place to have wind energy. I mean, you put wind turbines where the wind is. You cannot sort of do, have a bi-American, you know, provision to put it, do it in the U.S. You will go where the wind is. So a U.S. Uh, company, Sempra Energy, invested in wind turbines to provide renewable energy to California that has mandates on renewable energy. And I think this is 
another great example about how we can work together. And again, this is thinking about the future. And with all due respect, this is not about coal. I think it's important to look at how jobs can be created, not at job, how jobs can be created with the industries of the past. We have to think about what the future has in store for us. So this is a hopeful uh, a story. And let me end with uh, just a, an optimistic note. I'm also a so medium to long-term optimist and go back to Hazelton. Uh, Andrew and I taught a, jointly taught a course on Mexico-US relations at Johns Hopkins. And he always started the course with Hazelton, Pennsylvania, and I always forgot the name. Now I'll <laughs> remember, okay, it's, it's, it's Hazelton, Pennsylvania. And I did some back of the envelope math. The population of Hazelton is 25,000. The population of the US is about 237 million. So there are about 13,000 Hazelton stories to be told. <laughs> Okay, and I think the Hazelton story is very, very powerful. You mentioned um, Joe Madden, yes, from mm -hmm. the Cubs. Okay, so he plays a big role. Again, I won't do a spoiler alert. But he's you from Hazelton. To... Let's tease yeah, it with you, that. You have yeah. to read this to understand what uh, Joe Madden from the Cubs has to do with Mexico-U.S. relations and and, and Hazelton Pennsylvania. And, and Jeff Lunau, who won, who's the general manager of the Houston Astros, by the way, who who won yes. the World Series, last two World Series winners. So. You yeah. gotta read the book. <laughs> yeah, right. The one's the introduction, so, yeah. one's the conclusion. So you gotta yeah. go yeah. Uh, So uh, I'm optimistic but I, because I see that people do make a difference. And you talk about individuals making a difference. And I really want to congratulate you, Andrew, because you've been mixing passion with knowledge, with dedication. And I think that we need more of that. And to be frank, the opposite of that is when we may mix misinformation with passion. That can lead to very troubling results. So kudos to Andrew, and I'm sure that your book will make a very, very big difference. Felicidades. Gracias. Thank you, Antonio. Let me do one more quick round here, and then we'll open it up to your questions and comments. Let me also recognize Ambassador Jim Jones, who's joined us, former U.S. Ambassador to Mexico. And, and I didn't introduce her at the beginning, but Ambassador Roberta Jacobson, of course, who you hear from shortly, um, is with us as well, actually, and very pleased that she could join us and agreed to speak. Um, she just stepped down, actually, as Ambassador. And great to have you have you back in Washington. So we miss you in Mexico, having your strong leadership, but 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 also great to have you here. Um, let me, you know, following up on Antonio's intervention, you know, Carla, you and I have talked a little bit about the auto industry, and, you know, it, it features big in the book as well, but, you know, when you came in as USTR, the, the U.S. commercial debates had always been about, you know, how do we, what what's going to happen to the U.S. auto industry? And probably the biggest, most prominent topic was the notion that the American auto industry was going down and that foreign imports were going to eat our lunch. And you know, Japanese cars, German cars, Korean cars, Italian cars, we're gonna flood the market. That didn't happen, actually. In fact, hard to find an imported car these days. What happened with the auto industry? Because that is such a big story about the interconnections between the countries. Auto industry shows the benefits of opening the market. Today, our supply chains between our northern and southern neighbors in the auto industry are very, very tight. Uh, we have, uh, uh, about uh, 14 million jobs that are connected mm -hmm. with our uh, uh, supply chains. So if we cut those off, we're going to be really injured in the United States. This didn't happen before. First of all, Mexico was not purchasing that many products. Mm -hmm. But by becoming efficient, and getting the very best mm -hmm. geographically located, close, mm -hmm. close geographic locations of that widget you needed to make your product competitive made our auto, auto industry take off. Now, we do have a problem in the fact that uh, we are producing 40% more product with fewer workers because of automation. But that is a domestic issue. We need to have a program that trains people who are no longer using their hands on the manufacturing floor, but are trained by 20 weeks of training to deal with the technology of the 21st century. So uh, we need to keep our connections with Mexico and Canada, and it does worry me that we are taking this action under an old two uh, 
32 statute, uh, 1962, uh, called to protect our national security. Mm. It's hard for me to see mm. how uh, we are injured on steel and aluminum in having interactions with our northern and southern neighbors who are two of our largest suppliers. Mm. And some of that supply is like finished steel. We don't even make it in the United States, but we're gonna put a tariff on it. That will make it very tough for some of our industries to be competitive. And uh, the Defense Department has already said publicly, we don't use much metal, probably two or three percent. We're much more worried about the tariffs that are placed upon our closest allies. And I agree with that. So what we want, need to do is to maintain our relationship with our closest allies, focus on the problem that we see with respect to oversupply, join hands with our closest allies, and confront the problem directly. And that would be talking to China about subsidizing the steel, cement, and aluminum industries and making a deal with them rather than applying subsidies to our allies with whom we a, need to work in a, a political fashion, but also in an economic need. Is there, I mean, today, is the industrial, is industrial production in the United States tied with Mexico and Canada? Absolutely. I mean, if we, is it possible to think about American industrial production without thinking of the neighbors? So many lines of industrial production are, you can see it in, the, in, in what we import. We have 25% of what we import from Canada is U.S. content. 40% of what we import from Mexico is U.S. content. It's 2% with Japan, 4% with China. In other words, we're shipping back and forth across the border on so many things, auto being number one, where you make one of the products, put it on, ship it back. It go across our southern border in the auto section about five times on average. It's amazing. And we want to, if we cut that off, will be far less competitive globally. Yeah, I think, I think that's one of the things that's been missing in this debate is actually how much, or as we talk about NAFTA, how much you can't turn the clock back because, in fact, we are really integrated across the border. And, and what we do when we do damage to our relationship with the neighbors, it, it turns out we do damage to ourselves. It's Absolutely. A, a bullet that ricochets back on us and it's something you don't want to do in, in industrial policy. Um, since we're at the Migration Policy Institute, Alan, I'd like to turn to the issue of, of the border and immigration. You'll hear from Doris Meisner at the end here, who's our senior fellow and director of the U.S. policy, immigration policy program at, at MPI as well. But you wrote an article in, in the Washington Post a few days ago. But what, one of the things that's happened, as we know, is that you know since 2007, there are very few Mexicans crossing the border illegally. Um, there continue to be large legal flows of Mexicans coming to the United States, although also large legal flows of Mexicans returning to Mexico. I mean, it, it's somewhat of a stable uh, number of Mexicans in the United States. But the number of Mexicans crossing in unauthorized fashion, a regular fashion, has has dropped dramatically, but we've seen a rise in the past few years in Central Americans coming across. And this is something that has led both to cooperation, but also tensions in the relationship between Mexico and the United States. Do you have some ideas about how this could be handled? I mean, it, it seems that the, the tendency right now in Washington is to push back on Mexico and to say that Mexico needs to fix this. But you had some other ideas. So Mark Twain had a, uh, a terrific a bit of advice. He said, first get the facts straight, then you can distort them as much as you like. <laughs> and, and, and that's what we, uh, we see with the issue of, uh, of migration. Well, Andrew's right. As uh, Mexico has grown into the 13th largest economy in the world, it is no longer the sending country that we experienced over the last uh, five uh, or six decades. Uh, it's become a transit country because the driving factors, the push factors, <clears throat> are now affecting Central Americans, particularly in the northern triangle of Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. Uh, and they are all transiting through uh, Mexico. Uh, 
on the way to the southwest border. What uh, we discovered early on in trying to deal with the migration issue, as uh, Doris Meisner and Janet Reno uh, led the effort on the U.S. side in the early 90s, was that uh, it is extraordinarily difficult to manage uh, the borderline in terms of crossing and the repatriation of migrants uh, if you try to do it without the cooperation of your neighbor. And over, and it's taken us, fairness, it's taken us 15, 20 years uh, with the help of diplomats like Jim Jones and Roberta Jacobson to actually build relationships with our Mexican counterparts so that you begin to jointly manage uh, the migration issue at the border. Uh, but populism has always exploited the negative stories, the negative anecdotes to uh, make immigration a hot button uh, inflamed uh, issue in, in domestic politics of this country and uh, others. And that's what we're seeing uh, now with the talk of, of the wall or the declaration that we're going to prosecute uh, every one of the people who comes across the border in a uh, criminal uh, federal criminal court. Uh, that uh, may make, uh, as, uh, uh, as we say in the article, for a good soundbite, but it's not possible. Uh, the number of, uh, of uh, migrants uh, apprehended in uh, the last year, crossing illegally, for the most part from Central America, uh, numbered uh, just over 300,000. Uh, you could not possibly prosecute every one of those people. We don't have enough federal courts, federal judges, federal marshals, probation officers, or detention space to do that. So that's a, a, a hollow uh, idea that may have a short-term deterrent effect, although the initial data this month indicates that it has not uh, slowed the flow of Central Americans. So we need to uh, address downstream the two large issues. Long-term is the driving, the factors that drive people uh, out of the uh, Northern Triangle. Uh, and we have to address the fact that we have a broken immigration system which everyone agrees is broken, uh, all, although we don't seem to be able to come up with a comprehensive uh, immigration reform. Those are the two elements that have to be addressed. But in the, while we're waiting for those, uh, it seems that rather than talking of walls or talking about zero tolerance prosecution, uh, that we should be addressing uh, uh, the two major issues. One is we need to partner with Mexico even more than we have done fact of the matter is that Mexico, in defense of its own uh, national security and public safety, has uh, stopped 500,000 Central Americans who crossed into Mexico on their way to the United States. Imagine the impact on the southwest border if Mexico was not cooperating uh, with our needs, but doing it for their own purposes and driven by their own uh, uh, policy uh, requirements. So we need to strengthen uh, our, our relationship with Mexico with regard to the co-responsibilidad and the co-management of a migration problem that is continental in scope and not just limited to La Linea. It's the flows uh, uh, from Central America and indeed, in some cases, uh, from around the world. And the second is that we have a, a broken uh, immigration court system. We should not be emphasizing the need for federal prosecutions, but we do need to address a immigration system that has hundreds of thousands of cases in the backlog that are waiting for hearings. If we had crisp adjudications of, of migrant rights, we would not see what we see today, which is many people waiting for hearings two, three, and four years, uh, which leads not only to to uh, the building up of equities of people who then live here, develop jobs, have families, and then suddenly we have a hearing four years and we're going to suddenly rip families apart. That makes it difficult on that end. But looking at it from the other perspective, if, if I'm in Hazleton and suddenly I have 16 new neighbors who are waiting for an immigration court hearing and I wonder what is happening, uh, you can imagine the kind of tensions that build up politically and that, in fact, have occurred in this country. So we need to uh, strengthen our relationship with Mexico. Uh, we need to uh, strengthen uh, our immigration court system. And we have to stop looking for uh, the, the civil, silver bullet uh, that uh, simply does not exist when it comes to a complex social uh, issue such as migration. <clears throat> 
Thank you. I mean, and, and there is a deal in there to really begin fixing our system in a way that is both recognizes our immigrant heritage, our need for immigration, and at the same time, the, the fact that we do need an enforcement regime and we do need control of the borders, and gradually you want to move towards that as well. Yes, and there but, are ways of, of yeah, and one way of doing that actually is the is the safe third country agreement, which is an agreement that says that if I am a Central American, and I am driven out of my home by by reason of fears for my children's safety because of gang pressures in Tegucigalpa or San Salvador or Guatemala City, that uh, actually uh, Mexico would be the place in which that asylum would be asserted. And that would have some very beneficial effects for uh, uh, our uh, migration policy. On the one hand, it would discourage false asylum claims. And on the other hand, it would provide the refuge that we need to provide uh, for people who are genuinely in danger of uh, persecution in their home countries. Uh, what we need is uh, not neither uh, completely open borders nor sealed borders. We need the rule of law uh, to govern uh, at the border and in terms of dealing with flows toward the border. And we cannot do it without Mexico. Thank you. Let me ask you one more question quickly, just because uh, you've been involved in DACA, and I don't talk about it much in the book, but but I believe, if Doris, correct me if I'm wrong, 79% of DACA recipients right now are Mexican-born. I mean, so this is an issue that ultimately is an American issue that we need to deal with, but it does have bilateral effects. Yeah. Uh, this is an issue in which 85% of Americans, 80-85%, think there needs to be a permanent solution. Right? And as a result of, uh, of that, uh, after the failure of uh, immigration, comprehensive immigration reform in the Obama administration, a decision was taken, uh, recommended by Secretary Napolitano, uh, to actually uh, uh, promulgate the DACA regulations, which uh, was received, and uh, now upwards of 700,000 uh, young uh, Mexicans who were brought uh, to this country uh, uh, by their uh, parents uh, and, and grew up here and know no other country were given uh, uh, the, a right to uh, remain here and renewing that right every two years. Uh, even President Trump uh, says that uh, he is in, in favor of uh, the DACA kids, and yet he has said to Congress, Congress, you must be the ones to fix the, uh, uh, the problem. Uh, a federal court in uh, San Francisco and also, uh, I believe, in, uh, in New York uh, has ruled uh, that the way in which the DACA regulations were rescinded by the mm -hmm. Trump administration uh, was illegal. And as a result of that, the expulsion, the deportation of the DACA young people has been halted. But the matter is on appeal. It's just been argued in the Ninth Circuit in California, and invariably will go to the Supreme Court. And uh, we hope that there is a legislative solution uh, to this issue, because while there may not be broad agreement on many migration matters, 85 percent of the American people have uh, spoken on behalf of these young people who have made enormous contributions to our military, to our educational uh, uh, institutions, and to our communities. Thank you, Alan. Um, before we go to the audience, very quickly wanted to ask you, Antonio, yeah. about how Mexicans are responding to the current moment. I mean, there's been, Mexico has become a, a, um, a target of much of US policy, shall we say. It's become truly an object of, of the American president's attention. Um, I actually say somewhere in the book, and I know I've said this to a few of you individually, um, that sometimes when we talk about Mexico, we're not really talking about Mexico, we're talking about ourselves. You know, I think much of, of when we think about Mexico has become a symbol for our own struggles with figuring out what we want out of immigration, what we want out of our demographic future. Mm -hmm. um, Mexico is our struggle. We would talk about Mexico, sometimes we're talking about globalization. You know, it isn't really Mexico. Sometimes it's China. Sometimes it's a feeling that we're losing power in the world. Sometimes it's a fear of, of whether we can still compete. Not all conversations about Mexico are really conversations about Mexico. Some of them really are about ourselves. That said, in Mexico, when people hear these conversations, it does have their name attached to it. It has their country attached to it. How are Mexicans responding? Well, I would say that uh, they are responding in a very uh, sort of mature and even-headed and patient way. And I sense a contrast between the time when the NAFTA was being negotiated and the present. So I had the privilege of being a, a member of the NAFTA team. 
And it was a pretty controversial issue back then. You know, we were educated by saying that the U.S. took half of Mexico in the Mexican-American War, which we call it, you know, La Intervención, not even a war. <laughs> There's a monument to the uh, Niños Heres, to the, you know, children that died rather than surrender. We have the national anthem, Mexicanos al Grito de Guerra. I mean, this was our worldview. I even had some strong discussions with, say, my dad's. I, I, don't, I don't know why I bring family. It's a generational issue. Like, what are you doing with the NAFTA? You, you have to be very careful about the U.S. You know, they took half. Oh, no, I'm going to do NAFTA. So, I mean, this seems like a, the distant past. But now, we see the U.S. as our ally, our friend, our partner as a BFF, as some people would say, <laughs> right? And suddenly, our BFF uh, unfriends us, you know? And, and Mexico- You tried to figure out why, and if you no, should ask Mexico, or not, or what's the Twitter protocol, I wouldn't say the Mexico Facebook protocol. Is, like, even yeah. scared. I think, like, Mexico's, like, are in shock, like, what? What, what happened? Yeah. You know, uh, uh, we're friends, we have to get along. We, you know, all, all that, you know, complicated history is in the past. We need to get along now. More than ever. So there's like a disbelief, misunderstanding, but I think that there is still a distinction between the current US government and the US as a nation, the US as people. And I think that those are two different, two different things. And it's important to keep those two issues uh, separate. From a policy perspective, I think Mexicans have been very, very uh, cool headed, right? Just, you know. Well, today, as I was making my way here, I saw that the Mexican Federal Register had just pu published the tariffs uh, uh, in reprisal against uh, U.S. Uh, crude security actions of steel and aluminum, but still, it's a, it's a, it's a measured, uh, expected response. We're not being very, uh, very aggressive. And I would say that what, what I'm stating holds across political affiliations, across regions, Across ages, I, I uh, joked uh, a short time ago that uh, the current U.S. president managed something that only Lázaro Cárdenas, the Mexican president in the 1930s, managed, which is to unite all Mexicans. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we, fight, we fight over a lot of things. We are, yes. okay, supporting our, three, our soccer team for the World Cup, and we have the same views on the NAFTA, the same views on the wall, and the same views on needing to have positive and constructive relations with the U.S. Thank you. Yeah, I've noticed that as well, and I've, I've been actually very impressed in that evolution of, and this would be a moment to bring back that ultra-nationalism of the past, and it doesn't seem that that's happened. It's been much more pragmatic. And with that, let's go to the audience. Um, if you are in the room, um, it's easy. Raise your hand. And there's a hand up over there, and I will come to you. If you are not in the room and you want to ask a question, um, you can tweet to us at Migration Policy. Use the hashtag MPI Discuss. Or you can email us at events at migrationpolicy.org. And let's go to that hand, and then we'll go to Claudio Sanchez over here. I can't see who this is. And if you can identify yourself as well. Hi, I'm Guillermo Garcia. I'm a professor of law at uh, Texas A&M University. Have you heard? And just one quick anecdote to add to uh, Antonio's uh, message. I was born in 1982. And when I was uh, studying in Mexico, you know, primary, secondary school, our public school books included NAFTA. So it also included the war against the United States, but at the end of the chapter, it was, we're now gonna be part of a North American region. So we were raised to believe that Mexico and the United States were deemed to be together, that the frontiers were gonna be vanishing. So we were a generation raised under that perspective. And, mm -hmm. But I think now, I don't know what's gonna happen. Yeah. <laughs> and I wanna j piggyback a little bit on uh, their Mexican government reaction. There's a lot of push in Mexico to re-evaluate the relationship with the United States. And as you know, President Peña Nieto instructed uh, the government to revise all the memorandums of understanding that they have with the U.S. government on security and migration issues. And I, I would like to the, uh, the panel to talk a little bit more about that layer of the relationship. We focus a lot on the Mexican embassy and the U.S. embassy. But there is a lot of memorandums of understanding signed by agencies, by local governments, by municipalities across. So that's another level, uh, part of the story, the, the level of understanding that bureaucrats and agencies have with each other. And I would like you to talk about that. Let's, let's take two or three questions and then we'll come back to the panel. Claudio Sanchez from NPR. Good to have you with Thank us. you for the book. Um, I have a question about identity and um, <clears throat> I want to be concise. Um, I think your book is trying to get at the issue of identity in many ways and, and is in some ways at its core, 
But if we are to educate future generations about this extraordinary relationship between Mexico and the US, how is that identity evolving? And, and I want to be specific. In our coverage of um, deportados, uh, these US-born children who are now ending up in Chihuahua and Baja California, um, I tell the story of a nine-year-old from Barstow, California, who is now in Tijuana, but who sees himself as neither the US, a US resident, or a Mexican citizen. And I want to know whether this, n these new generations are going to, in some way, change, alter the relationship very deeply, precisely in the way that you've described uh, this relationship as a family, Andres. And please, if anybody has any thoughts about this identity issue uh, on the panel. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Good, good. Um, Pepe Diaz Briseño from Reforma. And then we'll go back there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Congratulations, Andrew, for, for the book. This is a two-pronged question, uh, probably one for Antonio and one for you. It's basically uh, how strong are Mexican antibodies domestically uh, against protectionism? And the second one for, for Andrew is, is Mexico ready to be an open society for receiving asylum seekers at this moment? The violence is playing very hard against any making a refugee claim there. How ready is Mexico to become a multicultural society? And uh, there was a hand up right in the back here as well. Uh, and yes. We'll go back to the panel. Yeah. Edward Hoyt with Apt Associates. I'd like to uh, turn attention to the NAFTA side agreements. At the beginning of my career, I worked on issues related to environment, and that was one of the issues covered in the side agreements to the NAFTA. It seems to me that the problem that we see both in the US and in Mexico now is that those who have not benefited from economic integration are raising their hand and saying, what about us? What needs to be done going forward uh, on environment and, so, and, and, and labor issues? What might have been done 25 years ago that would have maybe not prevented the kind of backlash that we're seeing, but maybe have uh, mitigated it somewhat. Those are a great set of questions. So let's go back to the panel. What was it, Antonio? OK, we'll get one more in, and then we're going to do another round. If we have time, we may have time. But Antonio, yeah. Thank you very much, Andrew. From the Acero. Yeah, from the Acero. Well, uh, um, can we give him a mic? Oh, over here in the, sorry, before we go back to the panel. Sorry, I did a quick change around there, so I, uh, yeah. yes. Thank you very much. Congratulations, Andrew. Um, well, usually when you think about innovation, um, you don't think in countries like Mexico. You think in countries like maybe Singapore, Korea, I don't know, many others. But uh, we do really analyze when we read your book that there are uh, important stories about innovation uh, across the border. So my question would be, in your experience and through your interviews, uh, which do you think are the, the, the best examples of uh, uh, possibilities uh, in cooperation on, on innovation uh, between our two countries? Uh, let's, let's go back to the panel. We'll go in the same order. So Carla, if you want to go ahead and start, any of the questions that you want to answer, feel free to to take them, and we'll try and get everyone among all the panelists. So mm. you don't have to answer everyone, though. The question that seemed most directed to me was the one about environmental issues under the North American Free Trade Agreement. Those were put in a side agreement in, uh, in, uh, to get uh, it passed through our Congress in 1993 by the Clinton administration. Mm. And uh, in the past 25 years, we've moved on. I think there's been a greater appreciation of the fact that we need to work together on environmental issues. We've had the Paris uh, Environmental Accord. Of course, the US pulled out of that. But that doesn't make the environment any less of a critical issue for mankind to work together. And uh, 
the, so the side agreements could be put into the NAFTA. I strongly believe that the NAFTA provides a very good foundation for our relationship. Not only our relationship, but as a model to the rest of the world. You remember in the, when we negotiated that agreement, there, we were also in the process of up, upgrading the general agreement on tariffs uh, and trade, the, the, the GATT. And we had no rules to deal with intellectual property, which would protect investors to, dis, to uh, pr uh, have a dispute settlement. When we finished the NAFTA, we had all those rules. And within four months of the NAFTA taking effect, the then 126 trade ministers came back to the table, finished the Uruguay round to upgrade the, uh, the GATT, put in protections on intellectual property, investment, services, all the things they copied from the NAFTA, including creating the World Trade Organization, so that North America became a model for what the open market architecture should be like in a regional situation. And we need to keep that. And uh, we need to modernize uh, the NAFTA today. I strongly believe, you know, our technology has moved ahead. You didn't have a cell phone in your pocket. You didn't uh, tweet. There, we didn't sell services over the internet. And we need to modernize the NAFTA not keep it at last century, but move to the 21st century and continue to be a model for the world. So uh, I think it is absolutely critical that we maintain and, uh, and upgrade the agreement. Ellen, yeah. anything you want to uh, answer? Let and I'll me, answer a few uh, at the end as well. Let me address the uh, memorandum of, uh, of agreement uh, uh, issue and the uh, capabilities of Mexico regarding asylum uh, going forward. Uh, memoranda, there are hundreds, as uh, the question uh, uh, stated, hundreds of uh, memoranda of agreement that uh, have memorialized uh, patterns of interaction and uh, ways of doing business. Uh, those ways of doing business and patterns of interaction don't disappear. Uh, and in fact, they have superseded in many ways the memoranda of agreement that uh, initialized the uh, interaction. So that in fact, uh, with the exchange of migrants, uh, with the uh, placement of Mexican customs uh, officers in Laredo Airport in Texas, uh, with CBP customs and border protection officers in OTI, uh, with Mexican customs officers now doing clearance in, uh, in American ports of entry, all of those interactions that were initially established through memorandum of agreement continue. Uh, and it will, uh, will only be undone with uh, specific uh, directives and frankly, uh, the people in charge of uh, Homeland Security and uh, uh, other departments uh, don't see the benefit of removing those interactions and they will, uh, they will continue uh, notwithstanding uh, the uh, review of memorandum of agreements on, on both sides. With regard to uh, the ability of COMAR, which is the Mexican uh, Asylum and, and uh, Refugee Assistance Agency, uh, it is very uh, uh, small and undeveloped. Uh, but in fact, uh, uh, you can ask, uh, uh, we uh, have developed a uh, extensive uh, refugee and, and asylum capacity in citizenship and immigration services, but we didn't always have that. So this is an, an occasion to start to build that capacity uh, with uh, the experience not only from uh, US agencies, but also from international agencies to say to Mexico, uh, you are now a transit country. You will uh, shortly become a destination country with regard to migration. And you have to build the capacity to handle asylum claims and refugee claims. And I, I believe the Mexican people have indicated uh, uh, they're concerned for human rights of migrants, uh, and they would continue to uh, support this. But yes, undeveloped now, but in fact, uh, we're at the beginning of a new era in, in uh, migration, and uh, it, it should be the occasion to build up that capacity. Antonio. Yes, uh, briefly on the uh, side agreements, 
I would say that most of the actions that have to be taken are at the national level, not at the by national or regional level. For example, in the U.S., there's something called trade adjustment assistance. You know, why does it have to be assistance? Why can't it be sort of proactive to make sure that there's ongoing training for workers? And why does it have to be trade related? What if it's a technology related? It gets very complicated. I think it's easy to blame trade, and especially the worst agreement that the U.S. has ever subscribed <laughs> for everything that happens in the U.S. But it is just wrong. It is just wrong. You need to do a lot of things. Uh, domestically, in terms of Mexico-U.S. cooperation, uh, perhaps Ambassador Jacobson will speak about this, but I think it would be great to have m much more uh, work transfers between Mexico and the U.S., Mexican companies in U.S., U.S. companies in Mexico, so that they understand business processes, but also each other's cultures. So I think much more uh, labor mobility in, in that way would be great, and much more student mobility now that I'm, I'm at it. So much more than that. and. Technically, well, one, one way to get stronger protection for environmental labor issues is to join the TPP. But oops, uh, okay, they didn't do that. Sorry. Don't make me cry. Okay, a, a, a second way to address that is to make sure that there is a strong dispute settlement mechanism in the NAFTA that covers new ambitious commitments on trade on the environment. But as far as I understand, the U.S. wants a watered-down dispute settlement mechanism. So I think that really won't won't cut it. And that's all I have to say about the set agreements. <laughs> okay. Now about the uh, antibodies in Mexico against uh, protectionism. I would say that that they're pretty strong. I think that the U.S. received a, a vaccine with Dr. Smoot and Hawley in the 1930s, but I don't know if the effects are wearing off. I don't know. Uh, in terms of Mexico, I think the, the vaccine is still working uh, pretty well. And when Mexico talks about shifts in trade policy, they talk about trade diversification, about having different markets rather than uh, protection. And in fact, in April last year, when it seemed that President Trump was about to formally start withdrawal procedure from the NAFTA, you didn't hear anyone in Mexico saying, good, let's take this opportunity. In fact, I was very happy to see that a lot of former NAFTA critics that didn't like me and my colleagues, you know, were now saying, no, no, don't, don't get rid of NAFTA. So I think that there's broad support for open and international trade, but there will be more of a focus on, on forging closer trades with Latin America, Mexico, did become a part of the CPTPP, it's modernizing agreements with Europe. So I don't see any risks of backsliding. I don't think protection would be the solution for any of the challenges we face. I think Mexico will have a more proactive, say, uh, I wouldn't call it necessarily industrial policy, but closer links between uh, business and government to make sure that there's a plan that work can work in an open economy. So I'm not concerned about Mexican protectionism. And lastly, on the assessment of the bilateral relationship, look, it, it's one of the world's most complex relationships. Uh, Mexico can di diversify trade links up to a limit. I just finished a paper for last time. This is the Latin American Studies Association. You're in the academic hat again. My academic good. hat. And I examined Mexico's trade relations from the time of Porfirio Diaz to the present. And during several of those episodes, Mexico has tried to diversify trade and investment links. You know what the success is? Yeah. Pretty close to zero. The U.S. is always the main partner of the U.S. and always will be. And Mexico will become increasingly important for the U.S. In 2050, Mexico will be the eighth economy in the world, larger than the U.K., larger than France, larger than Russia. So your book will become more relevant because the relationship will become uh, more relevant. And we just have to understand each other. We're not moving anywhere. That's it. That's why people should buy the book. <laughs> Thank you. Let me answer a few of the questions quickly, and then I'm going to introduce Roberta Jacobson, and we'll have a chance to answer one or two questions, too, when she's finished, and then Doris Meisner will close. Um, on, on some of the questions, on the economic, I say the one thing that wasn't mentioned that I think is worth mentioning is I, I think there is a lost opportunity in NAFTA to think about wages in Mexico. Um, wages in Mexico have come up. Um, they have come up in the in the export oriented economy, but Mexico has really good laws on paper. They're not always followed in terms of, of 
of labor and and there's a missed opportunity and the, the US proposal is simply to say that you know certain percentage of autos need to be made by people who make $15 an hour is not the answer that's an exclusionary way but there are ways of building in their protections um, that that Mex many Mexicans would be enthusiastic to have in there but but I think that is one of the questions that hasn't been touched on in the negotiations um, to Jose Antonio's question I mean there's a lot of innovation I have a chapter in here about which was really fun to write because I knew nothing about it at the beginning about innovation between Mexico and the US and I'm looking primarily at technology innovation sort of Silicon Valley like but frankly most of the innovation goes on within Mexican businesses and US businesses in Mexico and it's sort of this move from you know, basic manufacturing. One of the other things that changed with NAFTA is 25 years ago, Mexican, Mexico was a sort of peace manufacturer for the global economy. And you have this sort of movement up the chain where Mexico moves into advanced manufacturing and increasingly more complex processes. And you see the beginnings of Mexican companies moving into things like the auto industry as major parts suppliers. There's no major Mexican auto company yet, but there are a lot of major Mexican auto parts companies now that do very sophisticated design and operations, Mexican steel companies. I mean, there's lots of, you know, lots of Mexican companies have really moved up the value chain in significant ways. And so, but there's also the, the fun chapter was was about you know looking at sort of tech innovation, and hanging out with startups. I spent a couple of weeks hanging out with startups in Guadalajara, Guadalajara, which is sort of called Mexico Silicon Valley. It's sort of Mexican. I mean, if I want to be honest, it is Mexico Silicon Valley of 20, 25, 30 years ago. It's not really the Silicon Valley of today. It's still beginning, but you do begin to see companies moving into the space, getting capital, and really starting to expand. And you see a lot more that really could take off. And the biggest area has been financial technology, although there's a little bit in everything. But you know, particularly how in a country that has a lot of people who are not in the banking system, how do you get people into the banking system in creative ways? And so that's been the niche. And it's the kind of thing you can take to Central America and South America. You can take to parts of Southeast Asia and Africa. And so the betting on these companies is they will expand not just in Mexico, but eventually into other parts of the world. Um, on two questions of identity and migration, um, and we have a question also from Gretchen, uh, Gretchen Kutner, by the way, thank you for joining us, Gretchen, um, from Imume, from the Instituto para las Mujeres en la Migración, very respected group in Mexico, um, and who asked about specifically the safe third party agreement, um, and similar to Pepe's question, I mean, I, I think we, I, I applaud Alan for putting it on the table, I think it is, it's good to have it on the table because we sh Mexico should be thinking about how it brings up its asylum procedures to international standards and how it develops the capacity to deal with asylum. And having this conversation is very healthy. And we could see a point somewhere in the future where there would be mutual safe third party agreements, much as there are, you know, between the United States and Canada. Um, and, and people would apply in first, you know, the first country they come into. But it probably, there is no capacity right now with no disrespect to our colleagues in Mexico, but simply it hasn't, the capacity has not been developed yet to be able to do this in a way that would be in any way fair to Central American migrants moving through Mexico. So it's a good conversation to have on the table. Um, it is probably we're a distance away and politically at this moment where there are mutual recriminations or more recriminations in one direction than the other. You know, if I were the Mexican government, my sense is it would be very hard to, to get into this sort of complex negotiation. And I think that's been, Gretchen, my, the the reality of of where it is it's not going to proceed probably because the political moment's not there um but it probably shouldn't proceed yet either because the capacity isn't there but it's a healthy conversation to start um to to pepe's other you know part on this mexico has not been a multinational but a multi-ethnic country before right at least not in other than with indigenous peoples who have asserted their identity within the mexican nation um, you know, and that was a debate that started really in the late 80s, early 1990s, and, and was significant And the beginnings of a discussion around people of African descent in Mexico, which is now included in the census. So there's a little bit of a debate on that. Mm. But Mexico now has, you know, if you have a million or so Americans living there, many of whom are bicultural and, and, and legally binational, but nonetheless born and, and initially raised in the U.S., particularly the kids, you have, you have more and more Central Americans staying in Mexico. Um, you have migration through, because of economic ties with globalization. I think this question of being a multinational country is going to start, right? I mean, how, how can you begin to deal with diversity in a country that has not always thought about that as a calling card, right? And, and I think that's going to be fascinating. I know Roberta spent some time on this. I mean, this is going to be a fascinating discussion. I deal with it a little bit, actually, on talking about the American community in Mexico and how much that's changed, actually. One of the great interviews is with David Lunau, who's the, the uh, bureau chief for the Wall Street Journal, born and raised in Mexico of American parents. And he actually compares how it was growing up as an American, you know, Mexican-born American 
you know, uh, living in Mexico and, and how it is now raising his own children. You know, and how much that Mexico has changed, at least Mexico City, to be able to raise his own children as proud Mexicans, even though they have, in his case, American and British, his wife is British Mexican, you know, American and British heritage and how easy, much easier it is today. But I think that's a pending discussion. And it's happening more in the border region, perhaps, as well. And, and finally, um, to Claudio's question, you know, the first question, first or second question, Claudio, I think identity is going to make a huge difference. Antonio referred to this. Um, in addition to, to Claudio from NPR, Realize Ken Stern was with us. Actually, I think he may stepped out, but Ken Stern, who used to be president of NPR, um, the you know identity is going to make a huge difference over time. And I, you know we're seeing it, as Antonio said, with younger Mexicans. And, and our first speaker said this as well. Younger Mexicans have grown up with this notion of the U.S. is simply part of who they are. But it's also when you look at polling, the Chicago Council on Global uh, Global Affairs has a did some polling actually looking at how Americans see Mexico, and they broke it out by ages. And what's very clear is that younger Americans are much more in tune with Mexico, much more comfortable with Mexico, as they are with immigration, more broadly. And, and I think what you do have is they grew up also with Mexico being part of their life and with Mexican immigration being part of their life. You know, and increasingly they have, you know, many of them have Mexican heritage, right? I mean, you know, one, one of the things, there's an enormous amount of intermarriage between particularly children of Mexican immigrants, less with Mexican immigrants, but children of Mexican immigrants um, and, and people not of Mexican heritage in this country. And increasingly this is going to be simply part of who we are. And I think the newer generations on both sides of the border have assimilated this relationship in different ways than older generations have. And I think that gives me enormous hope mm -hmm. for the future. And I think as everyone on this panel said in one way or another, I mean, there's going to be a lot of tensions on the way, but it's going to look different down the road. Mm -hmm. And with that, let us move to, let me introduce, I have the distinct pleasure, um, I'm going to do it sitting because it's for logistics, but let me introduce <laughs> Roberta Jacobson, Ambassador Roberta Jacobson, who is just a, such a distinguished uh, public servant of our country, and thank you for being here. You literally just left being ambassador to Mexico, um, of the United States to Mexico, through the Obama administration and the, the first year and a half of the Trump administration. Um, she was has served in many roles since the 1990s in the State Department, has a master's from Fletcher, but I met her when she was the director of the Mexico office in the early 2000s, where she was dealing with a lot of these issues. She went on to serve as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Mexico, Canada, and Economic Affairs, I believe, and um, then on to be Assistant Secretary for Western Hemisphere, where not only was she dealing with these issues, but she was dealing with the entire hemisphere um, and was responsible, among other things, for the opening of Cuba, right, and played a huge role in our, in our relationship, developing relationship with Cuba. Um, and then we were all immensely pleased when she was nominated to be ambassador to Mexico and really through some turbulent times was the steadying hand in this relationship. Um, you, you managed to split the difference both on being you know, a true public servant who represents the government and, and serves the, the, the elected government and at the same time always remembering us, the, reminding us of the, the larger relationship between our two countries. And you left with both immense respect in Mexico but I think immense respect from so many of us in the United States who have followed your path. And it's good to have you back in Washington. Um, and thanks for being here. So Roberta, can you offer some remarks? Well, good morning. Um, thank you, Andrew. And, and thank you all for being here. First, I just I want to say that um, when Andrew first asked me to, to be here today, um, my first thought was, I don't know if I'm going to have time to read the book by the, by the event, because I didn't know exactly how soon I'd be leaving Mexico or whether I'd have time. I, I didn't have much time to read while I was there. And, and Andrew said, well, that's OK. We're not necessarily going to talk about the book. You don't have to read the book. Um, happily, I did read the book. Um, I did have time to read the book, because it's now exactly one month since I left Mexico. And, and I do mean happily, because it, it is among other things, the perfect antidote for the cynical, exhausted, negative uh, former ambassador or government bureaucrat coming out of a difficult job. Um, it, it is everything that, um, that you'd like to see in writing about this relationship. It is positive without being Pollyannish. It is backed by data. So I thank you for that contribution. Um, as I thank uh, MPI and the Wilson Center's Mexico Institute, which are always contributing to this relationship. 
I also, when I saw the list of people who were going to be here, I thought, well, heck, that's an incredible lineup. I, I definitely want to be part of that. Um, anything that Doris Meisner and Carla Hills and Alan Burson and Antonio Ortiz Mena and Duncan are part of, I, I want to be part of. Um, but I'm also really delighted to see Ambassador Jones here, uh, who's been such a wonderful mentor of mine. Um, and I want to recognize one other person here, um, and that's Jim Dickmeyer. Um, Jim is a former diplomat who, are you still a diplomat? Are you former diplomat? Yeah, more, more of us that I know are retired now. Um, but, but Jim was the public affairs officer in Mexico at a particularly crucial time, and I learned an enormous amount from him uh, during that period, and I want to thank him for being here and all that he's done over the years. I, to me, falls the task of, of final speaker, which I first thought was an incredible um, opportunity because I get to hear what everyone else says, and then I can comment on it, and uh, isn't that much easier? And of course, now what I realize is all the smart people have said the things that need to be said, and I get left with what? So I will make a few comments, somewhat random, I fear, but uh, hopefully a little bit of commentary that, that hasn't been said. Um, I think, first, one of the things that, that Andrew said about the first chapter is, is the title of Intimate Strangers is, is a very, very good one. Um, when most of us who were raised on Alan Riding's Distant Neighbors um, look since that time, some form of reformulation of that is exactly what we're looking at because it's not true anymore. Um, and I used in the first speech when I arrived in Mexico a comment that, that is in the book attributed to somebody else. Um, but I, I'm not sure whether it was around the same time, but I know that, that it, it spread from my first speech, which was we really aren't like neighbors because, as you've said, neighbors can move if you don't like who's living next door. We're much more like family, and a dysfunctional family at times at that, where you fight and you argue at the dinner table, uh, but in the end, you're stuck with each other, and actually, you love each other. Um, and sometimes we need an intervention, but we need to work it out. We are family. The other thing that strikes me is there's a Mexican expression that I think perfectly fits what's going on in our relationship right now. Mexicans say, es complicado. It's complicated. For everything from a bug bite to nuclear apocalypse, right? <laughs> But the fact that the relationship is complicated right now, and it is the perfect reference. Um, I do think that, as has been the case for a very long time, governments are inevitably behind the trends that their societies advance. And we are seeing a, a period of that yet again. I think Ambassador Hills would probably agree that when we negotiated NAFTA, as difficult as it was, we were in some ways codifying what existed because forces in the economy and society had already pushed that relationship forward. And I think right now, when we're trying to update it, we are doing so cognizant that there really is no way back. Um, you can have a perspective that says, we'd like to go back 30 years but where it's at is to look at what's happening on the ground, as Andrew does so well, and try and not just update NAFTA to bring it in line with what's happening, right? It had no energy chapter. It has to do better at IPR, e-commerce, et cetera. But how can we facilitate things going forward? Um, when I was ambassador, one of the things that I used to say to folks who were writing speeches for me was I would get a speech and I would say, where are the humans in this speech? There are no people in this speech. These are excellent talking points, but there are no human beings in them. Um, a really good speech, like a really good book, has people in them. And so I'm particularly grateful to Andrew for telling the stories, because what I constantly was asking for was, where are the stories that illustrate the page of statistics that you've given me, right? The statistics are compelling for those of us inside the Beltway, right? They are very compelling. 
right? Trade has quadrupled or increased six times, um, $1.6 billion of trade every day, et cetera, et cetera. Crossing the border, where are the people in those stories? Who has benefited from this? And the answer is in this book and in these stories. I wanted to talk briefly about the idea of Americans in Mexico, because it's something I worked pretty hard on. Uh, the number is actually probably between 1.6 and 1.8 million. Um, that's Americans who live full or part time in Mexico. It's a very rough figure, because we have no way of really measuring unless they use US government services. But we do think that about 600, as many as 600,000 of those Americans may be children of people who returned to Mexico, whether voluntarily or deported, who were born in the United States. And we've launched a program, the US government has launched a program with the Mexican government called Documentate, in which we are trying to ensure that those 600,000 or more kids, because they range from newborn to over 18, get their documentation. They're entitled to a US passport. But just as important is their Mexican documentation. Because despite the fact that they might be absolutely have a right to go to school in Mexico, they won't be allowed in without their papers. And they won't access the healthcare system. And if, as I think Claudio's question implied, if we can't provide their US documentation and their Mexican documentation when they return to Mexico, we may lose hundreds of thousands of kids who are then, frankly, fodder for any criminal enterprise or other uh, bad future because they don't go to school, don't access the healthcare system, don't use what they can. Um, and so some of the best things that I did were the public service announcements to try and get the word out. Um, it was fun for me because I got to meet Jesse and Joy, who are some of my favorites. And because they're binational, they were able to help us on this. But also these passport fairs that we do, where we go out, our consular folks go out, because we don't have consulates in every state. And working with municipal and local officials, we try and encourage every family to come in. We help people to get the birth certificates for those kids in the US. And SEGOB and Mexican officials help to do the same so they can be registered. I think that is absolutely critical. I would also note one anecdote, and that is that our consular agent in Oaxaca has been noticing a trend, which is um, many Americans who had originally settled in San Miguel de Allende are actually moving to Oaxaca because they're finding that Oaxaca is a little more Mexican than San Miguel these days. Um, so I think you know there is this this growing together um, that is absolutely happening. And my own view, I've often said that as a government bureaucrat for nearly 32 years, you have to be an optimist. If you weren't, you'd slit your wrists. Um, but I remain optimistic about the relationship in the long term. It makes too much sense. We have too much in common. We are joined by geography and, and families. Um, and we live better and provide better for our people when we are cooperating. Um, I used to also say that one of the distinctions between Mexicans and Americans, and Alan alluded to it, is that Mexicans live their history every day. They remember every part of the history and the offense, it is taught to their children, it is recalled. Americans, on the other hand, Estadounidenses, have a tendency to forget our history the next day. It is one of the things that makes us wonderful, we reinvent ourselves all the time, but it is a very significant drawback sometimes as well. And the best thing would be if we could meet in the middle. Conscious of our history and how we each see each other without living it every day, or forgetting it every night. Um, I'm particularly happy to see Alan Burson here because I will be honest with you, Alan used to drive me crazy as a policymaker <laughs> because, because he was tenacious in moving forward on things that everybody else said were impossible. 
And that is the sign of somebody who truly has a vision and who really believes that all the stuff that other people say can't be done can be done. And it was a remarkable change in our own thinking when we started thinking about pushing the border away from La Línea and doing things like pre-clearance or unified cargo inspection. But one of the other things I wanted to comment on was the notion of NAFTA as a paradigmatic shift. Um, I think one of the important things that gets lost in the NAFTA debate today is that NAFTA wasn't just a commercial agreement. And it wasn't just a change in our economies and more industries becoming integrated. NAFTA began a change in the way Mexicans thought about themselves and the way they interacted with the world, politically, even psychologically. When we talk about how younger Mexicans see themselves, you know, we're not talking about the Calvo doctrine. We aren't talking about why they should feel so estranged from the rest of the world, so separate. Special, but not separate. And I think one of the things that was important in this was a shift towards a bet, if you will, that Mexican policymakers made, beginning with NAFTA, that the future for Mexico was hitched to North America, not necessarily to the South or, or East-West, which does not mean that Mexico does not want good relations with the rest of Latin America, and it does not mean that they won't, shouldn't, or otherwise consider diversification of trade. But that notion that Mexico should open to the world had nothing to fear or be defensive about from an opening to the world was a very big change in the way Mexicans thought and saw themselves and is what is distinct from 30 years ago, I think. And I don't, I'm not sure you can put that genie back in the bottle. Um, the other thing I think is that the, re, the reforms that have been enacted under the current government, the very beginning of the current government, there's been a lot of debate about you know, do the reforms stay in place? Will there be a weakening of those reforms? Andrew's stories are very interesting to me because they underscore the importance of those reforms and, in fact, deepening of them going forward. If you think of what Blanca Trevino and others say about the future of technology and what Andrew just said about startups, that absolutely cannot happen without education reform. I don't know enough about education to know if it's this reform or another reform, but Mexico desperately needs education reform because otherwise its young people will not be educated for the jobs that they could move into in the 21st century. And we're not just talking about you know, the kids who can go to Tec de Monterrey or, or even to UNAM. We're talking about the Politecnicos and the fact that K through 12 is going to have to be different because you're going to need more than, than 12 years of, of education. Energy reform is going to be essential. Andrew referred to an amount of oil that Mexico is pumping. In fact, figures that I've seen are under two, 2 million barrels a day. And if that's true, which I think it is, that's the reason for opening up partnerships, not ownership, but partnerships in Mexico. And it's essential. Um, for the future of Mexico, both on, on non-traditional and on and renewable and on, on fossil fuels. And finally, and I really think that this is, is one of the most important things I learned in Mexico, which is the importance of continuing with judicial reform and the rule of law. Um, if there was a slogan that I came away with, a la James Carville, it would be, it's the rule of law, stupid. Um, it affects everything. It affects everything. Um, all of the positives and the negatives that we've talked about today are affected by whether or not the judicial reform takes hold, the oral trials take hold, they reform that whole system, and people have faster, more open access to justice. 
and less corrupting influence because it is more transparent and open. Um, it levels the playing field for the economy. It may even reduce some of the influence of narcotics traffickers or other criminal groups in government and society. But I will say that there's a backlash against that that's dangerous, right? Um, people see criminals walking free on bail. They think they're criminals. That didn't used to happen. And this push and pull is, is very, very worrisome about some changes that may happen. And it's really important that it be pursued. A judge in the Yucatan said to me, a magistrate at the local level, she told me a story. She had been a judge for a long time, but she was very much with the new program. And she said there was a woman and a man in her court. The woman was alleging that the man had stolen a rooster. Uh, and she had come to an agreement with him that he would pay her two roosters. It was the next door neighbor. And the woman said, uh 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 uh, he has to go to jail. And the magistrate said, but, but I'm getting you recompense more than what you lost, and you will have it immediately. And the woman said, no, no, I want him to go to jail. I just pounded on the table, that's not a good thing. Um, and this is the mentality that needs to be changed. Because under the old system, everyone went to jail. In fact, they went to jail for pretrial detention sometimes longer than their sentence would have been. But people think that, why should I just settle for two roosters when this bad man should go to jail? And his farm would fall into disarray, and his family might end up without anything to eat, and her own property values would go down, et cetera, et cetera. So it is a long process, but it's the only way that the critical issue on most people's minds in this election, number one, which is corruption, can be attacked. And that is through meaningful rule of law and institutional strengthening. So let me stop there. I have a lot of other random comments, but I'll save them for questions. Thank you very much. We're out of time, so I can't take questions. Well, we're at 11 o'clock, but if we're fine. five Let's minutes, we have two very quick questions. I see a hand in the back. We'll do two very quick questions. Okay. Here. Hi. Uh, thank you very much for attending and providing us with all this knowledge. Uh, my name is Miguel Blancarte, Jr., first-generation American. I was actually just living in Mexico uh, for the last two and a half years, up until about a month ago, living in Merida. Um, oh, nice. And uh, during the time that I was out there, um, you know, I learned more about how Mexico, um, over 50% of Mexicans are part of the informal economy. Mm -hmm. um, and kind of addressing my first generation Americanism, um, I wanted to ask as to how the importance, or what, how do you see the importance of those who are naturalized citizens from Mexico now residing in the States or even back in the back in Mexico now, um, their importance in civic engagement and um, politicking, if you will, just as important as, as important as those uh, Mexicans who are not part of the formal economy. Is there another question before we close it? Although I'd love to hear, let me, let's go to someone who hasn't asked a question yet. I see a hand back there. Hi, how are you? Uh, Laura Melvin from Gerson Learning Group. Ambassador Jacobson and also the panel, I'm curious your thoughts or how optimistic are you on some of the, the progress of the bilateral relationship as it relates to trade, security, immigration, energy reform um, under an AMLO presidency, given you know he's spotted some, some policies that are quite similar to what we saw during the Trump campaign period. So curious your thoughts on that. Okay, let me let me just quickly take those two. I, I think you raise a really important point. Well, let me take first the informal economy, and I'm I'm not going to try and compete with Antonio, who's a, a, a superb economist and has all the data. But we do know that that some very high percentage of Mexicans operate in the informal economy, whether it's over fifty percent or or not. Um, it, it's too high. It's too high for an OECD country. It's too high for a country that that's hoping to to grow. Um, that has to be tackled. And it, it, it speaks to the fact that Mexicans want to run their own business, want to work, um, and the government makes it hard for them. 
because of either bureaucracy or corruption and that has to be changed rule of law affects that too and your ability to operate your business free not only from that bureaucratic pressure and paperwork but also you know you're going to end up getting squeezed by potentially the cartels or others whether you're formal or informal and better to have your paperwork in order and protection of the state etc if the state is functioning as it should um i think there's an interesting thing about naturalized citizens someone told me that in san miguel de allende which has a very large u.s population of retirees there are something like 150 ngos um for a small city that's a lot of ngos but it speaks to well Many of those folks are retired, so it speaks to their desire to join something or create something. Um, but it also speaks to the fact that in the United States, there are you know, what we call civil society elsewhere in the world. Civil society here, we, we may be bowling alone. There may not be as much as there used to be, but there's still a fair amount of activism around whatever it is that you believe in, right? If it's environmental, if it's women's rights, if it's um, daycare for children, whatever it is. That is still on the upswing in Mexico. It's far better than it was when I first started to work on Mexico 15 years ago. But it's, it's a lower level of civil society, especially outside Mexico City, than you might expect. And I think influx of naturalized citizens, whether those are Americans who live there now and want to bring some of that organizational talent, but as much it is Mexicans or Mexican kids who've grown up in the United States and go back to Mexico and think, why can't we do X? And why can't we do Y? And they're used to being part of groups. And, and I think that could be healthy. That could be one of the positives. Certainly what we've seen in the United States from those who are Mexican in the US is once you get past a fear of undocumented status, you certainly have um, a presence and a voice that is important and loud and increasing people running for office and caucuses, et cetera, um, contributing to the United States in a way that I think is, is absolutely beneficial. Uh, the other question was about optimistic on 900 different subjects if AMLO wins. And I can't, I can't touch all of them. I will say again that I'm an optimist. I'm always an optimist over the long run. I do think, as was said at the very beginning, that it, we're in for some bumpy times in the short term. Um, but I'm not a catastrophist. I don't tend to think that any of the candidates running would be absolutely sort of, you know, I don't have a chicken little attitude that the sky is falling on, on any of them. And part of that, honestly, is because Lopez Obrador has said different things at different times. And I think we're going to have to see what ends up being the governing program. There are things about it that I think are very worrisome. There are other things that have been said that seem reassuring. Um, I think a mandate will be important because the most difficult thing to come out of these elections would be if they were so close that uh, there was difficulty in accepting the, the results. Thank you. Roberta, a great honor to have you here. Thank you for doing this. And I want to turn to Doris Meisner to, to close, but thank you, Roberta. Well, this book spans two countries, as we've heard. It also spans two institutions. This is work that began when Andrew was at the Mexico Institute of the Wilson Center. It was completed uh, as he became president of MPI. And so I want to close with thanking the Wilson Center, Duncan, um, for being here with us to partner on this event. It's just another great example of how we have had a relationship longstanding over the years that has been very, very productive broadly and in the exact example of Andrew and Andrew's work transitioning. Um, I want to also um, thank Wilson for its parenting. It's parenting of Andrew, who's <laughs> now been delivered to us uh, in the form of a very, very energetic and accomplished new president. Uh, we're very, very pleased, and we're very, very pleased, and therefore say congratulations to you, Andrew, 
for this very fine contribution as a real takeoff in your presidency here of our institution. And I also have to really say thank you to this incredibly stellar lineup of people that Andrew has pulled together for this launch event. I mean, think of what it is that you've all heard this morning. For those of us who are involved, and I want to absolutely include Jim Jones in this, it is so wonderful to see you, Jim. This is an incredible reunion. I mean, our lives and our careers, all of us, have interconnected and taken different forms and been in different institutional uh, settings for decades. Uh, it's extraordinary, and it's all come together here in this extraordinary conversation that's taken place this morning. And so thank all of you for being part of it, and by extension, for this audience in being here, also the audience that is on live stream. If you are looking for any more resources on any of these kinds of issues, particularly the migration-related issues, go to our website, www.migrationpolicy.org. Uh, let's continue the conversation. Please feel free to come forward and also for certain pick up a copy of the book in the lobby and I'm sure Andrew will be happy to sign it. Thanks for being with us.